Should you eat bugs? Hmm, there have been some interesting things going on in the last few years. There are claims that current farming practices are unsustainable and the consumption of most traditional animal products must stop. And apparently, having us eat insects could be the answer to this quote, problem. Many globalist organisations are at the forefront of driving this narrative and some of the Hollywood A-listers are also getting in on the action. I am here to reveal my hidden talent, eating micro livestock, corn worms. They're still alive. Mmm, extraordinary. Mmm, very moist, chewy, can't quite describe the flavor. Interesting texture. <laughs> it's chewy. <laughs> Need a little water. <laughs> Let's have a look at the alleged science behind this insect eating idea. I think they've worked out that most of you are not going to buy into their BS. So as we'll see, now they are targeting children. To be question of the morning, could insects be the solution to malnutrition and help combat the obesity epidemic? The UN's Food and Agriculture Organization certainly thinks so. It says a third of the world's population already consumes edible insects, like beetles and ants, and it also says the rest of us need to get into that stuff too. A few weeks ago, photos surfaced of an assignment that had been given to fifth grade students in a Florida elementary school. It was titled, Bugs. Food of the future? The assignment started by stating, Throughout history, people around the world have suffered from a lack of food. Modern farming methods help prevent food shortages. But the world's population is growing as well. Many people all over the world still go hungry. The next section says, Some scientists have a surprising idea for a source of food. Their answer to the problem? Bugs. Few people in the United States eat insects in any form. Hold up, that is a complete non sequitur. What problem? The United States doesn't have an issue with food production. Like New Zealand and many first world countries, the US can easily produce more than enough food to supply its own population and have plenty left over to export elsewhere. The assignment went on to state that the United Nations reports that nearly 2 billion people in the world eat insects. Okay, presumably they're implying that this is a good thing, but you'd really need to survey those people to find out whether they are eating insects by choice or necessity. In most first world countries, we have plenty of access to insects, but most people choose not to eat them as they don't need to and don't want to. Then the school assignment produces a chart purportedly showing the efficiency of turning feed into edible food. And look at this, crickets come out on top. It is claimed that by weight, they have twice the efficiency of chicken and pork and are way ahead of beef, which as you'll see, they really don't want you to eat. It's actually pretty dubious how these figures are calculated through their modeling. And the same goes for the claims of quote, energy efficiency. The concept of energy efficiency is typically misconstrued in the setting. As you probably know from basic scientific principles, the first law of thermodynamics states that energy in a closed system cannot be created or destroyed. It can simply take different forms. However, various parties are currently attempting to convince you that there is a shortage of energy, which is simply not true. The sun provides a constant source of energy for the planet, which is converted by plants and algae into stored energy, which then becomes food for animals. I also find this kind of argument disingenuous, as it assumes that reducing everything to the lowest energy, quote, consumption is the highest goal, not to mention the difference in what is actually being produced, i.e. crickets and beef are not comparable through mathematics. We are talking about ordinal preferences through human action here. So perhaps they need to be shown some Austrian economics to understand the fallacies of this kind of activity. 
Anyway, in 2016, a paper appeared in the Environmental Research Journal called Energy and Protein Feed to Food Conversion Efficiencies in the US and Potential Food Security Gains from Dietary Changes. Now keep in mind, there are various assumptions involved in this kind of modelling before they produce their apparent conversion efficiency charts, like this one. We can see once again they conclude that beef is the baddie and suggest that this needs to be cut out of your diet. The lower arrow depicting the apparent huge amount of energy quote loss is also deceptive. It is inferring that any energy that isn't converted into consumable calories is wasted. As mentioned before, energy cannot be lost. The next figure depicts the amount of feed going into the animals compared to how much resulting protein can be consumed by humans. Again, it is as though biology can be boiled down to some numbers. And once the all-knowing scientists have these numbers, they can calculate what you need to eat. How is it that they are coming up with these calculations anyway? Here we turn to the paper's supplementary material, which has some interesting revelations. It states, while it is tricky to compare the protein quality of beef and poultry, we can use the biological value and the protein digestible corrected amino acid score, the protein indicator of choice of the FAO. And who are the FAO? The Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. These guys are proposing the removal of individual choice and centuries of tradition to be replaced with made-up models and policy dictation from globalist cult leaders. All to save the planet, and in poverty of course. The environmental research paper doesn't go all the way to suggesting humans eat only plants or bugs, but that appears to be on the basis of a marketing problem. They state that Recognising that the majority of the population will not easily become exclusive plant eaters, here we choose the intermediate, less radical and perhaps more practical scenario of replacing the environmentally most costly beef with the more resource efficient poultry. The term intermediate is conspicuous because when you read more of the surrounding literature, it is apparent that intermediate means a halfway step to get the population off animal products completely. Beef will be off the menu first, followed by chicken and eggs. The Guardian's George Monbiot says it must be so. So eating meat and milk and eggs is an indulgence we cannot afford. I'm not saying that all modern farming practices are being done well, but there's no reason why they can't be and many farmers are embracing organic practices as both they and their customers realise the wider benefits. Here is the one cow we currently own. It roams around freely in large paddocks, feeds only on pasture and drinks water that comes from a spring. This kind of life is very typical for cows that live in New Zealand and those claiming that it is unsustainable are leading you down the garden path. There's also intangible benefits from being around the animals and learning to look after them, not an activity that involves models and calculators. At the moment, there are currently around 10 million cows and 25 million sheep in New Zealand. And no, that doesn't include the people that went along with the COVID-19 nonsense. For a population of around 5 million people and most of the land not being used for farming, the claims of it being unsustainable and a cause of climate change are a joke. Similarly, the United States has around 95 million cows, but the vast majority of its land is not being used for farming. Suspiciously on that front, globalist frontman Bill Gates has been snapping up farmland and is now estimated to own around 270,000 acres in America. And while he has become the biggest farmland owner in the US, he is promoting fake meat products to the population. Cows and other grass-eating species uh, have a digestion system that emits methane. And methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas. And so cows alone uh, account for about 6% of global emissions. And so we need to change cows, uh, cows just cows alone. Uh, How are we going to do that? Well, uh, actually, of all the categories, uh, the one that has gone better than I would have expected five years ago is this work to make what's called artificial meat. 
And so you have people like Impossible or Beyond Meat, both of which uh, I invested in. Do you eat it as well? Or do you like it? That's Absolutely. You, do. Uh, okay. you can go to uh, Burger King and buy the Impossible Burger. All right. Is it healthier for you or just healthier for the atmosphere? It's, it's slightly healthier for you in terms of less cholesterol. It's, of course, dramatic reduction in uh, methane emissions, you know, animal cruelty, manure management, and the pressure that meat consumption puts on land use. There were no references provided to check Bill's claims about the health benefits of eating phony meat. Like Gates, the mainstream media have been pushing propaganda for many years, driving a narrative that farming as we know it is now unsustainable. Ultimately, the agenda involves preventing the population from consuming any animal products, apart from insects. Let's have a look at some of the mainstream media outlets that have been pushing the eat the bugs narrative. Here is the BBC's Could Insects Be the Wonder Food of the Future? Story in 2014. Here is CNN headlining Food of the Future? Bugs in October 2019. And here is The Guardian's if we want to save the planet, the future of food is insects that appeared in May 2021. All of these globalist connected platforms are paragons of truth, of course, with your best interests at heart. The reason I decided to make this video was motivated by something closer to home. Here in New Zealand, the Ministry of Education published a children's article in a 2017 school journal that is part of the curriculum for eight-year-olds. It was titled Bug Bix for Breakfast, the title being a play on Wheat Bix, which is a popular breakfast cereal. It presents a table suggesting that you get more energy out of eating insects than other foods. Once again, it infers that we need to get more energy out of what we eat. Keep in mind that like the United States, the prevalence of obesity in New Zealand is extremely high, so I don't think that we are in need of higher energy foods. The article also informs the children that eating insects helps to protect our environment because insect farmers don't need to use as much land or water as other farmers. This is blatant brainwashing of the kids, inferring that our country has a dwindling amount of land and water, which, as has been pointed out, is pure nonsense. The children's article goes on to state, Scientists are starting to wonder how we'll be able to find enough food to feed our growing population. Bugs might be the best way to solve food shortages in the future. What food shortages in the future? This sounds completely contrived, and where had we heard this before? First we had Thomas Malthus informing the world in 1798 that the world's population was in imminent danger of collapse if it kept growing. The population at that stage was less than a billion people. Then we had Paul Ehrlich and his 1968 book, The Population Bomb. He predicted that by 1985, there would be famine on a global scale and most people would die of starvation. This is a CBS News special, Earth Day, a question of survival, with CBS News correspondent Walter Cronkite. Dr. Paul Ehrlich and Dr. Barry Commoner both biologists who were among the first to alert Americans about the ticking of the environment bomb addressed Earth Day meetings today. We have an, an extremely serious world demographic situation. The population situation is bad beyond what any demographer uh, even dreamed of 25 years ago. What about the resource situation in the world? Well, the most important resource to all of us, of course, is food. We have 3.6 billion people in the world today. Roughly 50% of them are hungry in one sense or another. This year, somewhere between 10 and 20 million people will starve to death on this planet. Last year, the same. The year before that, the same. Next year, almost certainly more and more and more. That's the answer to the question that's often raised. You know, uh, when will the population food crunch hit? Well, it hit a lot of people already. It's going to hit a lot more, more people this year. Should you think you're safe in the United States, you are very sadly mistaken. Well, the picture is then not altogether bright. Uh, the Hobson's choices we face, if we don't control our population and environment, uh, the horses in Mr. Hobson's barn include famine and plague and thermonuclear war, and who knows which one or what combination will come. And the question is, of course, what are we going to do about it? 
Well, the world's population has doubled since that time, and the claims that the planet can't produce enough food have been shown to be hogwash, constructed to serve other agendas. I mean, so many things have happened in the last 40 years that are so good, you just can't believe it. I mean, we've lifted more people out of abject poverty in the last 15 years than in the entire course of human history, in terms of sheer numbers of people. You know, and starvation, except for political reasons, is now pretty much absent across the world. That's quite something, given that there are 7 billion of us, and there's only going to be 9 billion, by all appearances. It's going to peak out at about 9 billion, and my suspicions are, in 100 years, one of the biggest problems we'll face is that there's just not enough people. And you never hear that, but I really do believe it's likely to be the case. And we can certainly carry 9 billion people without doing the planet undue environmental damage. And people who claim otherwise, I think, well... I think a lot of things about that. You can watch my video Anti-Fertility Vaccines and Population Control which exposes other aspects of the groups involved in population control. It is apparent that even on their own terms the whole narrative is inconsistent. We have an obesity epidemic and yet apparently we need to consume more energy dense food in the form of insects. Developed and relatively free market countries can easily produce enough food through current farming practices, and yet it is claimed to be inefficient. We are supposed to believe that we have reached the limit with personal energy use, and yet untold amounts of energy are continuously available. They claim that some livestock consume too much water, but governments are the cause of many, quote, water shortages. We have been told that the planet couldn't sustain a fraction of the human population that it currently supports. Yet, here we are. And of course, the fallback position when none of the doomsday predictions come true. Then they claim if we don't do something now, our current ways will lead to catastrophic climate change. Insects are a vital part of life on the planet, but much of their role is as cleanup crews. So what are the health considerations in regard to human consumption? In 2019, a paper was published titled A Parasitological Evaluation of Edible Insects and Their Role in the Transmission of Parasitic Diseases to Humans and Animals. While researching insect farms, they commented that We observed unethical practices of individual breeders, such as feeding insects with animal feces from a pet shop, feeding insects with corpses of smaller animals, or feeding insects with mouldy food and even raw meat. These practices significantly reduce the quality of the final product and undermine the microbiological, parasitological safety of such food. However, these are the kinds of things that insects are designed to eat, and will eat. The study also found large numbers of parasites in the insects. From a terrain perspective, we don't necessarily denigrate parasites as they have a role to play and their presence in increasing numbers indicates something in the underlying environmental conditions. In this case, it appears that they may be a cleanup crew for the insect cleanup crews. Nature is working as designed, but there's no need for us to eat this kind of muck. Another issue with insects is their exoskeletons, which contain chitin. Mammals do not contain this polysaccharide compound and cannot metabolize it, although we have some enzymes that break it down. Chitin is implicated in causing inflammatory reactions in humans after entry into the body through both ingestion and inhalation. This also includes the risk of developing asthma in those working in industries such as crustacean processing, thus suggesting that kids make cricket flour by cooking them and then grinding them up as this New Zealand Ministry of Education book advises, looks like complete foolishness to me. Unless, of course, you want chitin powder not only in your food, but also airborne in your home. I suspect going forward, though, we'll be told that there are no concerns and perhaps insect food will even be branded as safe and effective. If people want to eat insects, then it is up to them, but they shouldn't be forced into it based on bogus claims driven by globalist agendas. Any food or energy shortages we are about to experience have nothing to do with organic causes and will be manufactured situations induced by governments carrying out agendas from the likes of the United Nations and the World Economic Forum. The latter's open promotion of insect eating for the masses should be enough of a warning bell that something is badly wrong here.
On the other hand, what do the WEF elitists like to eat themselves when they meet in Davos each year? Why cheeses, ice creams and juicy steaks? From the alleged health point of view of eating insects, it's buyer beware. I'm happy to give them a miss and stick to the inherited wisdom from my ancestors, many of whom lived into their 90s consuming traditional New Zealand diets. If you enjoyed this video, please visit supportdrsam.com 